This is a little tutorial on attaching a prism to the end of your little telescope because the whole point of the prism is that you don't want to be looking through the telescope tube horizontally, you want the light to come up at the critical angle. So basically you have an old binocular prism and you have sets of these inside binocular and I got these from old binoculars, I couldn't collimate them properly, that is I couldn't actually see through both eyepieces focused accurately. So I took the prisms and um, the lenses out. Now, if you have a, an old tube, say at the end, say for instance you'd ha you had a lens at the end of a telescope tube, yours would be uh, large on this one. What you want is a focusing tube that fits inside. This is just for demonstration. Yours would be a larger because you'd have like a binocular eyepiece. But this is just to demonstrate. Um, you want focusing. The focusing is the you have, so you need a tube that's smaller than this than the one that goes into it, so you can go in and out to make it safer. I'd get some string and tape some string onto that, uh, the same length of string, and also tape it onto that. This stops it falling out, the tube. Now, how do you fit the prism on? Well, this is the tricky bit. Really, you shouldn't touch these optical surfaces with your fingers. The sides of it, it's OK. What you need is for light to be going down the tube, and you need, you need the prism to be light at that angle. But to attach this prism to that tube, my best suggestion for you, is you've got your critical angle there, so light's coming in down that tube there, hitting at 45 and being internally, ref total internal reflection is going to come up. So your eyepiece rests on top like that. But how do you hold the prism on? Well I got round that, remembering my physics, uh, I had some very good physics teachers who I knew, and you cut strips of black paper and what I've done is folded this into like a sort of a, a sling really and basically what I do is I fit the sling around the prism okay, hold it in place, it doesn't have to be perfectly in the middle as long as it's flush the either side and you wrap the sling around like that, so it's wrapped it, it's cradled the prism, do you see? so basically I've, I've cradled the prism and at the back of it all you can see is black paper now don't get any brown tape of this tape on the black sling, all you've got to do is cut strips of brown tape the same width as your black Right, and then wrap them round, but don't get any on the prism itself. Okay, that holds it in place, and also you can put some other strips of brown tape there. Then you'll need to put your lens, which rests on the top there. Slightly more tricky, but not impossible. Cut yourself some more strips, possibly longer ones than this one, and yoke them round the lens like that. Okay, this is, this is from binoculars. Then all you have to do then, as you can see. As long as I've got the binocular lens on flush at the top, okay, about there, right, I've then got strips of this black paper cut like this. You can have longer ones, obviously, and wrapped around like that, and this will already be taped on beneath it, and then you've got to just yoke brown paper all around it, okay? But this bit of the prism that you can see underneath here, you could just put a tiny piece of black paper there to cover it. Then you've got no tape on your prism and you've enclosed the whole thing. I'd also recommend obviously putting more strips of black around here, longer ones, and then you can just have loads of loads of brown tech going around the whole thing, bandage it up, okay? Don't forget rules with scissors. If you're below a certain age, and you need to adult supervision in using scissors, that's just common sense. This will be a finished article made from a binoculars, uh, binoculars tubes. You can even make, you can make two of these from one old pair of binoculars that, that you can't get to work properly or even you just want to use binoculars for astronomy so you've got the front lens there, it's 50 millimeters, and, and an old binocular eyepiece at the back and I've enclosed a prism in here and the focusing device is like such, as you can see if you've got one tube of one size and you want a focusing tube of a smaller size and you can't find one smaller use the same size tube, right, but then just score it, cut it underneath and then you can fold it over slightly so that it will fit inside. Okay? If the gap between your focus tube and say this tube is a lot more, say, say for example you use this type of tube, which is a plastic tube, then you're going to need to use some of this, which is basically just bubble wrap. Okay? And then basically you've got to then wrap enough, cut bubble wrap, wrap it around this tube. Don't, get, don't make it longer than the tube. Wrap it round and around until you get the right fit inside this tube. And then, then again you've got the same... Um, function. Don't forget to do what I did though, and that is to have length of string taped, if you see that round there, taped to there securely, and also taped to there securely. And you can use different types of tape 
uh, this duct tape's good, brown duct tape, and also they d they, there's a more of a sort of a tougher version as well, which you can use as well. Also, with your front lens, which is your objective, be very careful, because I found that cardboard and these lenses, you really need to wrap that tight and use plenty of tape to hold it in place, because otherwise you, you take it out upside down and that lens can fall out, you know, the, the objective. But these can, can give incredibly sharp um, images, incredibly sharp focus, rich field visions from a binocular, far more useful than using a pair of binoculars. And you can make two of these from one pair of binoculars. The advantage is, and I'll demonstrate very simply, and I've si had said this before, if you're looking overhead on binoculars, you have to crick your neck to look overhead with these. That's vertically overhead, right? And it's a zenith, and I'm looking like this, and I'm not stressed at all, it's like a periscope, and I'm seeing directly overhead a sharp clear view wide field and anywhere I look whether it's if it's in straight in front of me I'm looking down like that okay as I go up which is astronomy you're looking in the sky I'm barely stressing my neck at all I could spend uh, literally hours looking at, at objects what I suggest you do is use these you can get a simple star map but without a star map just have a look spend some time having a look without being bogged down by all the technology and all the you know, paraphernalia of astronomy and all the books and all the information, it's all valuable stuff. But get out there and do something practical. I mean, get familiar, look at the colours of the stars, see if you can see patterns in them. Then start looking for constellations, look for your own birth sign constellation. I found mine, Pisces, the fish, like a shoal of fish, like a faint sort of V-band shape of stars. But through this particular, because it's wide field, it's more useful than a telescope and more useful than a heck of a lot of astronomy information because you're using your own eyes. Wide field, you can see galaxies like Andromeda, that's M31, and you can also see clusters and beautiful chains of stars and the moons of Jupiter. I've been able to see the four moons of Jupiter even at this low power, okay? And it's much easier to use in a pair of binoculars, and all you need is a very old pair of binoculars up to you but just giving you an idea. This is the four and a half inch reflector telescope Conus. It has a focal length here you can see on the tube it's 900 millimeters and the mirror as I say is 114 millimeters. I'm looking at the moon at the moment and it's daytime and the new moon was on the 12th of November. Today is the 18th of November so it's six days old and I found it in my finder scope and I've set the crosshairs up, so it's not quite exactly in the middle of a crosshair. I'll take this up to the eyepiece, you should be able to see what I'm looking at. Here we go, hang on. That's it there. And that's a six day old moon in a blue sky. Obviously be careful if you are using telescopes that you don't have a look at the sun. Make sure it's nowhere near the sun because the sun obviously can blind you. But it gives you an idea of what you can see. If I just pass the camera back, the telescope here is very roughly set up. I haven't I haven't set up to the, the pole star. Normally the pole star is at that position here, but to make it safe, as I say, I dropped the tripod down. And I've not tracked it on the motor, but it's going quickly. And I'll just see if I can quickly just pick it up for you again before it disappears behind the roof. But the moon's always an interesting target in the daytime. As I say, be very careful when you don't point at the sun. So another quick look then while we're here. Here it is. Try and reduce some of the clear. Of course, you can use a moon filter on this if you want to. Um, and don't forget, with a Newtonian telescope, you're actually looking at the image upside down. And I'll just try and see if you can see any, any craters on the moon there. I think there are some there. The Terminator's not very clear in blue sky, but it will as the sun starts to set. I mean, what time are we now? A quarter past two, but we've had uh, daylight savings, so in actual fact it's quarter past three in astronomy terms. Um, there you go. The moon in bright daylight. Let's just see what we can see from my finder scope here. These are the crosshairs. And somewhere the yep, 
near the top of the roof they can probably might be able to see a crescent on the one of the lines that's how I've lined it up there there it is there Just thought I'd grab the opportunity to look at the full moon. It's the 28th of November 2012, and it's an opportunity to see the full moon. Um, behind me in the sky, there is a full moon, and to the left of it, four or five degrees probably in the sky, is the planet Jupiter. So, we're going to have a look at both. The telescope, as you can see, I've just put the light onto it so you can see it a bit better, is uh, it's Conus Motor 114. Electronic. I haven't got the motor on today, and it's on an equatorial mount. Um, I haven't set it up on polar axis because the moon's in such a position on the ecliptic. Um, Just had a look at the full moon through the moon filter, it makes a big difference. Switch the telescope onto Jupiter, all four moons visible, of the Gal Galilean moons are visible. I found that the, the the angle that the moons are at on the planet at the moment as it's rising uh, seems to be, if you take the vertical to be uh, naught, it seems to be about sort of 20 degrees to the vertical by the eyepiece, but don't forget with a Newtonian telescope you're actually looking upside down at the image so it's 180 degrees change. First thing I do is I take the eyepiece and I get the moon filter off, that's the moon filter there, there, take it off, see if this should improve the visibility. You can use filters when you're looking at a planet, it can help and I'll see if that improves matters. Yeah, that's considerably improved it. With a full moon in the sky, it's much harder to see faint objects. But that's improved it. Stop.
You should be able to see that my screen is set for f 2.8 16 seconds we're, and also even, even at plus 3 on that and I've set it at high quality and there is noise reduction looking at my telescope through this at the moment so if I look at the actual pictures I've taken using this focus you might be able to see them better there you go and you can just about make out in that picture which I know it's on video the whole constellation of Orion Betelgeuse at the top there Sirius which is the brightest star in the northern hemisphere it, it, it might well be visible just to the very lower mid lower right down the, uh, the bottom of that screen and the clouds they're genuine in the sky but I do like a bit of drama and contrast in my pictures there you go and there's another shot there and I've zoomed in there using the telephoto on IESP on the spot focus on the belt of Orion through my washing line, just with a bit of contrast so and again you can just make out Orion there through the washing line and this is the tree, the moon's just about to appear through the trees and you can still see some stars through the washing line there that's handheld, everything else has been on this tripod that's facing the other way in the sky, quite a misty murky sky but you can get some interesting shots, it's just interesting to see what your camera can pick up on even what's you know, not a fantastic quality night for astrophotography and you're learning all the way on the best type of shots to take which is really what I've been doing, just scrolling through the shots now okay the one thing you need to do is to make sure that the front lens on your camera doesn't fog so carry some lens wiping tissue with you um, that doesn't scratch the lens because that will be your biggest enemy on foggy nights like this so basically you just need a, a fairly sturdy tripod and this one's not too bad and the camera screws underneath there you can see like a little red dial there that sticks up and there's a little uh, under the camera there's a little um, hole which that screws into and basically don't drop your camera make sure it's firmly on and basically you've got this handle here which loosens and you can tilt the camera as you can see like so into the sky and then you twist that twist this handle to tighten it and basically there you have astrophotography I've extended this astrophotography already because I've taken some pictures of the beehive cluster at the eyepiece all I did was use a manual setting on the camera because um, you've got a automatic P program or manual I chose manual and I chose about three seconds and I put the camera up to the eyepiece of my telescope over there and putting it right up to the eyepiece there of my, of my telescope I was able to take some pictures at three or four seconds just holding it steady what you can also do which I'm experimenting with is you could also have the camera on video setting and set it on the maximum um, ISO setting for that say ISO 400 and also it does have like a noise a simple noise reduction if you do if you have got noise reduction as a menu option on your camera then always use it and you could probably stack the frames even handheld you might be able to pick up as I did um, stars probably I don't know maybe of eighth magnitude if you hold the camera very steady so you don't have to always have a tripod but obviously if you're taking exposure of 16 seconds or so you're going to need one slightly misty night just before midnight and the moon is up it's just past full so using this telescope I've got here Looking, if you look down the telescope here, you can see there's a nice clear optical path. Okay, and I then use the sighting here to sight for the moon. If you bring the camera just to the door, you should be able to see the moon in the sky just with the camera as is. Now, a sight, if you bring it down to me again, a sight, a sight the moon. And once it's sighted, I'll then see. I can show you what's on. Okay. Stop now. Let's go right up to the eyepiece, though. Let's bring the thing. You nearly had it. Tilt it back forward to the eyepiece. That's it. There you go. Can you, can you try zooming it slightly? No. Let's tilt it slightly that way. Okay. Okay. 
something like so. Okay, stop. When you're looking at the moon through your large telescope, you can start by looking for the little spotters. These are prismatic spotter scopes, and there's the finder. Stop. The advantage of having the tripod, as you can see the on the equatorial mount, is that you can get pictures such as this. This is much clearer, and this is a basic video which is low resolution, but it's a steady, and you can see there's mist crossing the moon. The advantage of having the prismatic viewers on your scope, as I've got them set up here, so I can very easily find the moon through this spotter here and see a low power view of the moon so that way I can find it quicker and then use the other large magnification of the telescope to see it better or I can put a camera to the spotter so we'll try that next so here we have a view of the same moon as we've just looked at the big telescope through the spotter It's gone. 